27 years, and one of the motivations for me is to get uh, a few Indian Americans elected onto the, uh, first of all, to the Congress, now City Council, and also I support the South Asians. And in my day job, I work for Amazon and do what we do best, please the customers. So again, uh, welcome to this panel discussion. I would like, uh, again, thank you so much for joining this panel. And our panel's topic today is uh, the current top challenges faced by the Silicon Valley schools. I think it's a pretty interesting topic, and I know we'll have a very good discussion about it. First of all, before we get started, I would like to uh, give you this mic, and each of you can just give a brief, like maybe 30-second intro about yourself, so that we set the stage and get cracking. Thanks again. Good evening. My name is Raymond Mueller, and I am a parent and... Uh, chair of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee in the Alum Rock School District, and I'm currently running for a trustee position there. Our district's got a lot of problems, and uh, some of his parents feel that we should make some change. Hello, I'm Balaji Venkatraman. I'm a current trustee of the Evergreen School Board. I'm also a technology executive and a faculty member at the State University. Thank you. Yes, I'm Bill Wilson. Uh, I'm on the Fremont Union High School District, which is in Cupertino and Sunnyvale and West San Jose. Uh, I've been on the board for uh, since 2006, and I'm currently the board president. I'm Hong Wei. I'm on the same board as Bill. I'm 11-year uh, high school board member serving Cupertino and Sunnyvale school districts. And so um, that's, um, I'm going to pass the mic. Well, good evening. My name is Chris Norwood. I'm currently the vice president of the Mel Peters Unified School District School Board. Um, I'm a uh, systems administrator for Stanford uh, University, and I'm a longtime Mel Peters resident, so that's why I was able to answer your question about uh, what Mel Peters stood for. Good evening, everyone. My name is Patrick Ahrens. I am the district director for Assembly Member Evan Lowe, and uh, just recently a trustee elect for the Foothill De Anza Community College Board of Trustees. Born and raised here in Silicon Valley, and uh, really honored to talk to you today about these important issues. Thanks, gentlemen and lady. It was really nice. Uh, you guys are very well accomplished, and I know there are too many issues to talk about. But what I'm going to do is, I, I just was doing a little bit of research before getting started. There appears to be three main topics that, in my perception, but you can always add to that. One is the student standards. Uh, what's happening with the student standards, the second is the teacher standards, and the third, of course, is the, always a discussion is the school infrastructure, uh, whether it's supporting. Uh, and it's not only a Cupertino issue, it looks to be the whole Silicon Valley issue. So starting with the stu uh, student standards, uh, the biggest challenge that we have seen today with, with the glo global economy coming in, there's a co earlier when we were like 25 years ago, students we're in a different bubble kind of a thing, but with this internet coming in and everything opening up in the world, like now if you are now competing with Asian markets, China, India, the student's standard has to be improved. So what do you, do you think we have been able to accomplish that in the last 10 years since the market has opened up? Uh, may I? Oh, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to pass that to you. All right. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> Education is the ticket to success, right? It is that passion for education that um, you know, drives me to teach in San Jose State and serve as a trustee. And so as a trustee, my core focus is to educate the students on uh, the core capabilities, right? Math, science, team, right? There's a lot of other things that we have to educate our children on, but you have to give them the basic educational capability, number one. The challenge is uh, disparity in academic achievement. Right? We have um, schools that are in richer and more affluent neighborhoods as opposed to schools that are Title I. And so we see that disparity and closing that achievement gap is critical for our success, our children's success, and our community success. And then the third point that I want to make is it's not just about academic and book learning like we used to do 20, 30 years ago. What we have introduced in Evergreen School District, and we've been recognized as an exemplary school district in all of California, is project-based learning. So it is not just STEAM. It's not just understanding how to do math. But with Common Core, you have to be able to parse an English language sentence 
to be able to solve the math problem. Therefore, language proficiency, the ability to interact as a team, to be able to do projects together, is critical for our success. And this is how we in Silicon Valley can educate our children and maintain that edge. So I think the first way to respond to that is to say you have to think about what standards mean. People immediately jump to things like test scores and so on. And those matter, they're an overall indication and our test scores are very strong. But to me, the real standard is, are we, help, are we ensuring that all of our students are prepared to be successful after they leave our high schools? And for that, we've got 11,000 students in our high school district it really means tailoring programs to meet the needs of all students, to have equity so that we apply the resources that are needed, and those are different things for different students. They may uh, need English help with learning English. They may come from a family that doesn't have the experience of going to college, in which case they need to be shown how there's a path to get there. In other cases, it's, uh, they, we want to have comprehensive high schools so they can pursue their passions. So when you talk about standards, it's really helping all students succeed and reach their full potential. And that's, that's a big job with 11,000 students, but I think that's what we sign up for uh, in the high schools that we really want to achieve that. So I'm gonna add to what Bill says. Um, so there are, what is, a standard of success. And I believe that term needs to be, what do you mean by being successful? Um, is it to make a lot of money? Is it to be happy? Is it to do what you love to do? So Fremont Union High School District has a really good reputation, but we have all kinds of students. Education is not one size fits all. So we do have a variety of programs that are gonna fit different students' needs. And the define of being successful is very, very important. So I, I have two kids that are totally different. So I, I usually tell my younger kids, who is a social worker, that we sit by Stevens Group Boulevard at Pete's Coffee, we see Stevens Group Boulevard cars around, I said, this is your Champs-Élysées, this is your parents, you're with your friends, you're with family, you're happy. Well, your brother might be able to take his wife and his kids to the real Champs-Élysées, but there's no difference in meaning. Success, they're both very successful to me. So we like to teach our kids to be passionate about what they love to do and, and do deep. They don't have to be good in math and science or everything, but if they are good in a couple of things and they're proud of what they do, they go deep, that's what we like to do. So what I mean by, what we, Fremont Union High School District mean by comprehensive education, that's what we mean. The kids, not just academic, they want to cultivate their extracurriculars, their leadership, their passion. Um, do so many times parents approach me, why don't you make Mana Vista a, a magnet school, a STEM school? We said, I'm always said, we're already a magnet school. We're already a STEM school. But our kids are great in music, they're, they're great in drama, they're good athletics, they're at BLA, they're, you know, they expand their horizon. So we don't need to be magnet. We're already magnet in what they like to do. So um, that's, that's define success. I think that's very important. Thank you. Um, I'd like to um, possibly turn the conversation on its head a little bit and, and go back to a comment. Um, the achievement gap or the opportunity gap has always existed. Um, but we started, measuring, we started measuring academic performance differently about two decades ago, pointing out these differences um, We started pointing out these differences for a number of different reasons. And the biggest challenge that happened when we began to do that was that the students began to lose. The reality is that, and, and the trades began to lose. And a number of careers that were valued began to get lost because the achievement gap pointed out the fact that students weren't performing on certain particular academic standards, our math, our English, uh, in some instances, literature, social sciences, on our sciences. But there are kids that are very, very gifted in a number of different ways. So in Milpitas, um, the, the viewpoint that we've taken is that we've developed what we call the culture of we. And we, we identify the fact that we are a city of immigrants, we are a city um, that has had 
was surrounded by two uh, man high manufacturing industries, but we have really very high performing kids. And so when we look at our city and the work that we're doing around the culture of we when it comes to academics, we know that the opportunity gap has always existed, but that doesn't mean that there isn't opportunities for everyone to be successful in the Bay Area or in the Mel Melpitas Unified School District. We have programs that take our students out to uh, Silicon Valley career technical ed. We have programs um, that have internships for our students as well. So when you talk about this subject of student standards, the, 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 real, the real question is that what is the vision of your community for it to be successful? And I also, just in conclusion, want to add one more topic. Um, school, two topics, school safety, um, because we live in an area now or in a time where we see some things that are happening across the country and we all realize that it's not a matter of if, it's going to be when and where. So school safety is very, very important. Then also student mental health, because in some of these high performing school districts, we have students that have extreme amount of stress and B grades uh, put them in a mental state which in, in, is danger to themselves. So I want to make sure that that's included in this discussion as well. Thank you. Good point, Chris. I want to, yeah, go ahead, Patrick, then maybe I want to do one. I just, I completely echo those comments. I think that when we talk about the success of a lot of our schools here in Silicon Valley, that success uh, oftentimes comes at a price. And for a lot of our students who feel the immense amount of pressure and coming from someone who has not gone, uh, you know, went to high school not too long ago, uh, I remember vividly the amount of pressure and the amount, uh, uh, amount of drive that we are putting on our students today. And uh, many of them will, can and continue to turn out, uh, out into the, in their, in their careers as extremely successful but uh, they have these lingering issues that they're dealing with, and it stems from the amount of pressure that uh, it is to be a Silicon Valley High School student today. And those, those issues need to be addressed Absolutely when we're Patrick. talking about student success. This is exactly what I was trying to get at is, if you look at if anybody you ask in the Silicon Valley, they'll talk about three schools, not three of the schools, like Gun, Gun High School, Monta Vista, and Mission High in San uh, Primano. These are known for the kind of pressure they build on the students. So the, my question is, hey, from the teacher's perspective and there's an industry perspective, right? Teachers want, like Hung Wai said, happiness, and I believe in that too. <laughs> that is why I really like what she said, because I think the, t the kids have a lot of things to do after they go out of high school, a lot of fights outside, but in school, what do you think is a really a good, I want what's one line message if they're listening? Hey, I want you to do this. What would be that one message? They, they are conflicted. Hey, I want to get A's. Every, I want 10 APs. Do this, do that. You know, they get into this muddle and they don't even go into sports and nothing. There's nothing there. So, what do you advise when there is so much competition coming from the foreign countries? When the kids are coming in here and their jobs and other stuff, people they see. So, what would they? What do you recommend them to do? The kids in school. First of all, I want, I want to step back just a second because I kept hearing about affluent schools and these high-performing schools, and I think one of the things that's missing here um, in the school districts like ours where many of these families are living two job lives and can't get engaged. And so when you're talking about pressures, when a student has to go home and take care of their two younger children, and they're only in sixth grade themselves, there are different pressures for different groups, and I think that was something that was missed. Um, so as far as what would one say to, to the students? Um, and the parents, of course. <laughs> uh, to the parents. Let's start there. To the parents, get involved. I think that's one of the biggest issues that we have. Many of the parents think that the school will take care of their child. So I think that's an issue that we have in our society because we have been raised that way. The, the community and the city will take care of things. Um, I think that for the students, the one line is just, just keep doing it. Just keep trying. You know, just do it. Okay. Um, to the parents, I echo what you said. Um, you know, I was, I'm running for re-election, and I walked the community, and someone asked me, what can I do to make schools better? And I said, be involved in your child's education. If every parent is involved in their child's education, their classroom, their local community, 
then we all benefit from that. So that's number one. What do we tell the students? Yeah. Learn to learn, right? We have to be good uh, citizens. We have to teach them that. Uh, the standard uh, messages such as don't bully and, and be respectful, be respectful of differences, all that applies. But whether it is uh, socioeconomic situations or academics or in future, if we can teach our children to learn, they will succeed in school and beyond. Okay, so um, th this is a really important topic, but I think the issue of stress and mental health are sufficiently important that it really needs to be partnerships. So we focus on this in our schools, but we also partner with El Camino Hospital to work on mental health with students. We partner with Santa Clara County to have linked services so that families can get the help they need for a variety of things that impact our students. Uh, so those partnerships are critical. We partner with JDL to work on anti-bullying messages so that uh, we can help on that score. Uh, we've worked with the community. We've had a citizens advi a wellness um, advisory committee in the community, which has looked at things like our schedule, not just starting later, which we have done a little bit of this year, but also the question of homework. Do we need to give as much homework as we do? Sometimes teachers think quantity of homework is useful, but all the indications are exactly the opposite. So we're trying to change that culture. The schedule has a bit to do with it. So having Mondays, which have block days, so they don't have every class on Monday, so they can have homework in every subject on the weekend. So there's a, a whole set of things that have to be done. Um, and providing and, and getting to your question of what you would advise students, we do emphasize comprehensive high schools so that we've got all the programs Hung talked about, the athletics, the drama, the clubs so that people can find a passion and we strongly encourage everybody to find some sub-community within the uh, high school. And then finally with parents, you know, we've got a variety of parents. We've got parents who never finished sixth grade and so it's useful to work with them to show them that there is a path for their student to go to college if they so desire. We've got parents who think there may be three or four universities in the US where their child should go. And we try to work with them to help them understand that in the university system and college system in the United States, there are hundreds of wonderful places to go. We have a jewel right here, as Patrick can attest to, in our community college system. I'm teaching a math class at De Anza and I do it because I love interacting with these students who are so resilient. Uh, and the sky's the limit for where they can go. So getting that message across to parents is important. At the same time, we've got other parents, we have to encourage that it, it's worthwhile for their kid to try to stretch themselves and see where they can go. So 11,000 students, there's no one size fits all. We've yeah. got to address all those can things. I, can, can, can I, uh, so we both are in elementary school districts and that's high school, oh. right? And so, <laughs> Right. So, so there's a difference in the kind of students that we have, right? And so what we get the younger kids where we have an opportunity to shape yep. their thinking and, and their, their evolution, as opposed to you get a little bit more. We get the results. We get, you, and, 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 and then, then the community the, colleges get the results of what you all and, do. And, and then you give them back to me when I go to San Jose State and teach them. So it, it goes a full circle, but that's why for us, parent engagement is extremely critical, number one. And, and then to complement that, at least in our school district, we have allocated significant amount of money and funds to have counselors in the middle school, number one. And two, we are also focused on the well-being of teachers. So we have a mental health and, and uh, mental assistance uh, group focused on helping our teachers. Our teachers and our staff are critical to the success of our district, critical to the success of our students. And so it's not just students. In our case, that's the easier problem, if that's you a, will. 
Good right? segue but to my to. next section. Yeah. I'll continue from that side, sorry, but uh, about the stu uh, teachers. That brings my next point is, there was some research which was done last, uh, last year. The, student, the rating of teachers in uh, California, not in Silicon Valley, I, I'm not sure in Silicon Valley or California, they rated as the like, teacher standard as 4.34 compared to the national average of 4.48. They're saying the teacher standards in California are not that high compared to the East or the Midwest. Why is that? Anyway, you can start from that side. Yeah, yeah, that's well, yeah. um, a couple of things, just in, in the, with that topic. The teaching standards in California, relative to the opportunities that the teachers are provided in, Cal in California, in the Bay Area, you have a number of different types of schools. So for example, in Milpitas, we're, um, we're traditionally called a K-12. But what we've determined is the fact that we are no longer a K-12. We are a CDC to adult learning. So we, we're going down as early as three years old to su support students with CDC programs. And we also have an adult learning program as well. So we look at the holistic but the whole nature of how to serve the students. So, but also at the high school, we have our, our CS program, we have our AP program. So I believe it's a little bit of a misnomer in terms of how the different teaching standards are rated based on what the communities are, are asking for the staff to, or the teachers to do. When everyone was talking, I, re, I thought of a statement and the statement was, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village. Now, how big is a village? to raise one child, not multiple children. It takes one. So when you, when you put the burden on a parent, and everyone in this room understands the 80-20 rule, or excuse me, the 20-80 rule, 20% 20 of the people do 80% of the work, no matter what it is. So the idea around full parent engagement when not all parents are educated or comfortable because they've had horrible school experiences, you're asking for things that aren't necessarily going to be probable. So just kind of circling back to your original statement. And that statement is the, the ranking of teachers. Yeah. That's a misnomer. So they're coming down to that. Basically, I like your phrase about your opportunity index and that you've been there. So similarly, I have a, uh, for the teachers, I think there's something like expected progress of a student versus the actual progress. That's the rating, let's say. That would be the best rating, right, for a teacher. Hey, I, I expect my son who, or, or my whoever the child is in the eighth grade, what do you expect or after the 12th grade? So how do you? How do you, what's the best way to rate a teacher then? Well, it, it, in my humble opinion, it's not that because the underlying numbers there are based on test scores of the students and the test scores miss so much. The standardized test scores are not really indicators of student progress and frequently a teacher will do something very effective for a child that might show up in their learning years from now. So to take some test at the end of June and say that tells you much about the teacher, I'm skeptical of. Uh, I think we've paid a lot of attention to how the staff on our school sites goes in and observes teachers and looks at what they're doing so that they can see how effective teachers are. But it's from the point of view of help, as most businesses would, of helping people get better at their job. We want to help teachers get better, and one of the key things of that is having teachers work together. We have professional learning communities so that it's not just the students in my class, but we have joint responsibility for the students in this school, and we're going to work together to do our best. And I think that improves the craft of each individual teacher, along with teacher mentors, which we have, and professional training. So I think that's important. At the same time, there is a challenge in California, in particular Silicon Valley, that we heard about before. And it's tied up with the cost of living and the cost of housing. Yes, yep. It becomes harder exactly. and harder to attract good teachers. The, and, and so we have to do what we can to raise revenues so that we can increase teacher salaries. And we have to partner with our communities to try to make more housing for teachers and one last thing, because this is a, such an important subject, yep. is we have to treat teachers as professionals. One of the things that's happened is that there are fewer people going into the teaching profession. And it results in a real shortage of teachers. And if there's a shortage of teachers, it's harder to get the really high quality teachers you want. So we need to do more to make 
the teaching profession a desirable thing to find ways to encourage the best and the brightest to go into teaching. And that's a, a statewide yes, thing and a national You touched thing. upon that topic, which I, I was alluding to, and you nailed it. I think that it's about attracting the good uh, teacher from, but the, he, when he comes here, he or she sees the ROI, the salary and the apartment cost and the food cost, and we can't attract the best talent, the Bay Area. So then that leads to the infrastructure, the housing problem, housing challenges, and uh, then the, related to that, even the school. It's, now the whole schools are so bloated up. Like they don't have enough space for all the kids. They go to a different district, all this is happening. So that's, uh, okay, let me keep continuing on this. How do you attract a good teacher to the Silicon Valley? What would be your advice? So one Maybe. of my aspirations um, is we, we, have, we are public agencies and I, school district are not standing alone, they're part of the city. So I like to promote city and schools collaboration in providing teacher housing, in providing uh, library services to give our teens a safe place after school, and in providing education it takes a village, it takes a city to educate our kids. So public agency collaboration is part of my aspiration. So um, I think a lot of people know that I am not going to run for Fremont Union High School District. I'm running for Cooper Hill City Council. And one of my goals is to promote collaboration between public agencies. And I believe a city is responsible, part of the responsible city is to educate our kids. We can do so much more together. We can do uh, joint summer programs. We can do uh, you know, a pro programs in the libraries for teens. We can provide teacher housing. That is a very important, yes. Patrick, you have to add something? I, I wholeheartedly agree. That's why we need to work on getting more people like Hung Wei elected to the city council uh, for Cupertino. And we need more people like her to run for office across Silicon Valley because she gets this very fundamental question that I think a lot of Silicon Valley communities are wrestling with right now, which is the housing affordability crisis. And frankly, where our city councils fail to re their, meet their arena numbers and fail to, to build enough adequate housing for the thousands and thousands of jobs that have been created this valley, uh, even since the Great Recession, we need to build more housing and we need to target teacher affordable housing. Sarah Chafin has led that effort throughout Silicon Valley. Supervisor Joe Submidian has a wonderful project right now uh, in partnerships with many of our school districts and our community college district so that we provide community, uh, housing for our teachers because the reality is uh, how good of a teacher or how good of anything are you when you are having to commute from Hayward or Gilroy to Palo Alto to Cupertino to Fremont to Malpitas every single day uh, there and back. Patrick, it, it, uh, thank you. Sorry. Uh, we got, we're running out of time, so I just want to give this 30 seconds for questions. I'm sorry. I, I have a, it's a very interesting and very important uh, discussion, very close to the, a lot of people's hearts, but I want to a little bit give them the opportunity to ask some questions. I want to make an observation. Um, I'm a consultant. I go into a lot of the high-tech companies and some of the government agencies, and I also teach at the master's level, so kind of well, uh, well experienced, so to speak. But uh, what I hear from the CEOs of the more mature companies, as opposed to the 20-year-old CEOs, is that they cannot promote their very brilliant high-tech people management and they can't promote them into management because they have no soft skills and so you keep talking about STEM, you keep talking about grades, you keep talking about um, pushing them in a kind of a singular direction and yet all of those subjects that will quote liberal arts soft skill subjects are going by the wayside and that I think is doing our community and, and our future leaders a great disservice. So one piece of the comment. The second piece of the comment is um, I had the good fortune for many years to be in a relationship with the admissions dean of Stanford Law School. He's been deceased for 20 years now. They got bazillions of applications for a few seats. And everyone had a 4-0, and everyone had perfect scores on the LSAT. 
And the way that Bill evaluated to determine which students were going to get into the law school were on their other activities, their life outside of school. And I think we've, both things I think we've lost. And I think it's really important that we think about what is it we really want these kids to be in the future rather than straight A students. This is also an observ observation. I noticed all of you across the board spoke about mental health. And my children went through elementary school in 25, 30 years ago almost. And uh, at that time, there was no conversation about mental health. What has changed? Like, everybody's talking about that. Well, one of the main reasons is it's we're just now starting to destigmatize that thought. It wasn't that mental health issues did not exist. It, they've always been there. I would argue that they're more pervasive now than ever, given the amount of pressure, uh, frankly, our community is having on the students. But I think so many brave young people are talking about their mental health issues. Uh, I myself suffer from depression. And that you could not say 15 years ago and run for office. You could not say that. Uh, and having this open dialogue about mental health issues uh, is groundbreaking and it's just so we can actually start to address it as a community. And I would piggyback on that to say we're in a data we're in a data phase. Everything is tracked now. We have, we're in the information age and everybody's recording things. So one incident of a child at a school across the country, we're all, we all have that as a data point. And we, we, we identify it as a mental health issue. So while it may not be in large numbers, the fact that we're tracking everything and we care that much about our children and we understand the stress that they're under, we can identify what the issue is. And now more and more people, as you stated, are willing to call it out to make sure that it's addressed. So that is why it's much more prevalent because we see the, we see the data shows us that it's on the rise. And if we don't do something about it, as including developing those soft skills, uh, we're going to see more and more uh, tragedies at our schools, not only from individuals, but in mass quantities. Uh, well, if Rudy, I want to take, I have a comment and a question. Our comment is again on this uh, teacher uh, quality. Uh, our children are uh, gone to college a long time back. You know, the, the day the, la the youngest child passed through high school, the top priority of the school thing slipped from that top position. But then it was top, my biggest issue always was the uh, teacher quality. And that made me some uh, major, uh, made me take some major decisions. Uh, in one last instance that happened was when my uh, child came very upset from the school, uh, middle school, uh, because he had an argument with the geography teacher right here in the heart of Silicon Valley, who was telling him that Mount Everest is in Colorado. Now, I've heard this, that Mount Everest is in Colorado, some other places in America. The first time it was in Wichita, and second time was in Salt Lake City. But happening right here in California, in the heart of Silicon Valley, was a surprise. I bolted. I went out of San Jose and tried Cupertino, but housing was an issue. I ended up in Palo Alto. They graduated from Palo Alto High. Teacher quality was always an issue, but now things have changed. People are very conscious of it. I do not keep up with the thing, but I have a question. What is uh, this the school consolidation or? I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> All right. So a comment on your comment, which is um, teacher quality, right? And, and you had asked a question. How do we attract good teachers? We treat them as professionals. We expect them to be professionals. In our school district, uh, out of the uh, 32 school districts in Santa Clara County. Our teachers are one of the best paid. We have the best healthcare program uh, available for them. We have a trust in addition for their retirement. So we try to attract and retain the best teachers. We provide them a lot of training opportunities. So that is how you attract the best teachers and retain them. Um, to consolidation, you earlier said in one of your remarks that schools are overflowing. At least in the elementary school district, that is not necessarily the case. We have gone through a demographic cycle 
and after the boom of 2000 and during the recession, the Great Recession, uh, people stopped having kids. Thanks to Prop 13, we don't have home turnover. I had two school, uh, my family is contributing two kids to our school district. I just dropped my younger one off in college in August. Right? In my street, there were 20 kids, now none. So we don't have the problem of overflowing. We have de de no, no, declining, in, in San Jose, in Evergreen School District, we have declining enrollment. And so one of the issues is there is, a, there is a thought in the community that we close those schools and move that money to, to other users in the general fund. And our position is, no, those are exactly the schools that we don't close. We provide neighborhood schools, we provide education to every community, especially the underprivileged, socioeconomically challenged community, number one. And when we all recognize that small classrooms are better for children, they have better academic outcome, why close schools? So we are fighting to keep all the schools open, neighborhood schools open, and that is how you provide better education. That is how you attract teachers. You don't put 30 kids in a classroom and stress the teacher out. You put 24 kid, kids in a class and help the teacher. That is the right way to do it. Thank you. Um, yes, I'd like to go back to teacher um, quality, quality of teachers. Um, as a school board member, our, one of our major jobs is to support our teachers to be good teachers. Teachers are also learners. They need to learn together, they need to support each other, and they actually are the most important people in a school system because they touch the kids every day in person. So as a school board member, we are here to support our schools, uh, our teachers, give them professional development, give them um, the respect they deserve, and raise them up. And I, I wanna say Fremont Union High School District have really good teachers because yeah. we really give our teachers the resources they need. And you know, we have uh, created teacher uh, learning, okay. professional learning development, and then we have teachers to teach teachers. So that's what a school board member's major, one of the major jobs is to really to support our teachers, to lead them into great teachers. And, and they, when they understand that a school district and board of trustees and all administrators respect and support them, they are excellent teachers. Yep, great, thank you so much. It's an excellent point. And uh, I'm thinking it's, I think, amazing discussion and have great points, I think, right, audience? So it's awesome. Thank you again for taking the time thank you. to be on the panel. And I also, again, want to thank Diana Ding, the, the person thank you, behind Diana. the show, and thank you so much for hosting us again. Thank you.